I'm very happy to introduce uh, another member of our Scientific Advisory Committee, Ernesto Lupercio, who was one of the original members of our Scientific Advisory Committee, who to introduce the next speaker. So many members of the advisory committee. <laughs> <laughs> it is a delightful pleasure to introduce Dr. Gabriela Olmedo. She is my colleague at Simvestav. Simvestav is meant to be uh, the elite uh, research institute uh, uh, in Mexico that is not quite associated <coughs> to a university, a little bit like the IAS in the US. And the uh, fields in which it is uh, strongest is actually the biological sciences. Uh, Dr. Olmedo is one of the finest uh, biological minds in Latin America. She uh, is a researcher at the Department of Genetic Engineering uh, at Simvestav uh, and the director of the Irapuato campus of Simvestav <coughs> since 2013. Uh, she got a PhD in uh, macrobiology from UPenn in 1990 from, uh, uh, with the advisor Philip Jungman. And she has been a visiting professor at the Salk Institute. Uh, her uh, fields of expertise are RNA biology, and uh, more recently, uh, molecular ecology. Uh, she has investigated uh, with her team this uh, made amazing discoveries in the molecular ecology of the uh, Cuatro Cienegas uh, ecosystem, but may, we may hear more from her in her talk. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Gabriela Olmedo. So thank you, and I want to thank you, Stephen, for this invitation, also for the pleasure of being part of the advisory committee to the Institute of Mathematical Sciences of the Americas. And I, um, Really glad to be here in the company of, of Mina for, for this particular public talk. And just to start, I'll tell you that my work has to do with bacteria, with microbial communities. Now, let me tell you some of these properties or the, or the things that we, we don't know. We figure these are sort of like networks, and we wonder how does the network work as a whole? How do they speak to each other? What are the rules? Is there a backup system? Which is the language mechanism and how to handle huge amounts of data? So if you remember, this is exactly <coughs> what Mina was telling us. These are exactly the, the same problems that, that people face when they try to understand how neurons work. And that's you know, a little bit of, of what happens in my work. So in my work, mm, say like the magic of my laboratory is the experiments. We are very good experimenters. So I can pretty much make things work in the lab you know, in, in an amazing way. But we really need the bioinformatics, the computer people, the mathematics, uh, and the physics from other people to not just understand our data sometimes, but to make models and hypotheses, to then go back to the experiments and, and, and work on this. So we really, you know, work very close to, you know, to a lot of, of people so that we can, you know, do this work. And this is what I'll tell you about, you know, today. I will, you know, give you a primer on microbiology. I'll tell you that the DNA is at the origin of evolution of life. And this is the main questions. How can thousands of species co-occur in a community? And these communities, you'll see that you can you know, think about that of, the, of your brain, you can think of that of your gut, you can think of, the, of a forest or anything that, that makes a community. And then I'll tell you, you know, that we want to understand what are the rules of assembly of communities. I'll tell you a little bit how we set up these things in, 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 the, in Cuatro Cienegas, which is an amazing place in Mexico. And finally, how we try to reduce all this information into more simple systems in synthetic ecology, where we try to understand only a few cells at a time, and we always are blocked or stopped by emergent properties. 
So we'll start with bacteria. And bacteria are these small things that we do not see, but that they can divide very quickly. Maybe every 20 minutes, you will have a clone of a bacteria. So from one bacteria, you get two, from two, you get four, eight, 16, etc. So you immediately see this exponential pattern, okay? So this is, you know, an interesting pattern in which bacteria are just duplicating all the time. And a lot of people say, okay, so what is the limit? I mean, can they cover the whole earth? Of course they cover the whole earth. They can inhabit every niche, but not numerically, because they have a limited. It happens that after some time, bacteria find themselves into an ecological problem. So ecology is the limit for bacteria, and that's why they don't just continue you know, growing and growing all the time. So if you actually graph bacterial growth, you'll find more like an S shape. And this is because between the R, which is the, the, the velocity of growth of an individual, and the N, which is the number of individuals, a K gets inside, which is something that limits the population side per capita. So K means what is the maximum real value that any species can, you know, can get? How many of, of them can we get? So if we start with a very small n, with a very few individuals, and a high capacity for growth, we pretty much go to an exponential phase, you know, which is here. But you know, if the number of people, you know, bacteria or whatever, gets larger, then you start to like fill up all this capacity and then really growth has to stop. So what is limiting this? It's a limitation for resources and it's competition. So this is how I do my work. I use petri dishes. And so I don't have a forest. I don't have you know, to work with electrodes and, and things. I have my petri dishes. Bacteria don't complain, okay? I can just have thousands. So I have all these bacteria. I only <coughs> see them, really see them with an electron microscope or another optical microscope. But I can just use a Petri dish and then every of one of these little dots, it's really a colony. A colony forms when a single cell lands on a Petri dish that has nutritious you know, media. And then in just 18 hours, I can have 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 9 cells. Okay, I told you exponential you know, growth. So next day, I can readily, you know, my students can set up an experiment. Next day, next day we have results. We have this Petri dish, and we have all these bacteria. However, you can see that some bacteria are very large, some are small. What is happening is that's what we're seeing. We are seeing a resource restriction. They have a different K, a different you know, R, and so each one is, you know, really playing by different rules. But when they get together, then they sort of like are in, in, in each one's way. And so what happens is, for instance, this one cannot reach more because it just reached out of space, right? The Petri dish ended. And some of them, like this one here, you know, maybe some should be just as large as these ones. But if they are very close to the large ones, the large ones got the resources, okay? So you can do ecology just in a, in a simple Petri dish, and that's you know, a lot of what I do. But one of the questions is, where do bacteria come from? I mean, why, why are there so many, and how are they distributed? Why do I have some in a Petri dish? So there is this, this idea in biology that everything is everywhere, and the environment selects. So we have this idea that, that bacteria and general microbes are very good to disperse in, in the world. I mean, they, they are so good to, to move because they can move with water, they can move with, with, with wind, and we can move them around when we travel, right? Like the coronavirus, and you know, that's how we move things around. And everything moves around because it has no restriction. You know, if you don't, you don't often see birds, you know, or, or some things like out of place. Like bears, you know, they, they, they are restricted by the food they eat, right? They are restricted by the environment they need. But what is the restriction for bacteria? 
So that's the question here. It's like, if bacteria can move around everywhere, do we find the same bacteria everywhere? Even outside Earth. I know, I know. It's a real concern. <laughs> if spacecrafts are taking the spores of bacteria out to, to other places, okay? So they really decontaminate, you know, the, the space, spaceship all the time. And there is also a question. Did spores actually, you know, came to Earth? Is that the origin of life on Earth, right? Is they just came because they are very resistant. You see, coronavirus. Excuse me? Coronavirus, yeah. Coronavirus. It's not bacteria. No, it's not as resistant. You know, if, yeah, coronavirus would not be a problem. It's, it, you all know anthrax? Anthrax is a problem because it makes spores. Spores can, can, can la you know, last 100 years. You know, in, in some experiments in Frederick at NIH, they had to close a building where they were working with anthrax because it was easier to close the building than to clean it, okay? So some, some things are, you know, more difficult than others. So we are sort of like an example of a community of bacteria. We have so many cells inside us. You know, and we have even more bacteria, three times more bacteria than our own cells. So now we wonder if our genome, that's all, all the genes that we have, we are more a bacteria than, than a eukaryotic cell, right? Because we have many more genes and many more things because of the cells that live with, with us. And so the question is, how do they get there? How do even we measure this diversity? I told you, you know, we can see it on a Petri dish. But I didn't tell you that my Petri dishes can only cultivate 1% of what's outside. My Petri dishes are not telling me the truth. They are just letting some things grow and not others. Okay? So how do we actually know what lives you know, in, in us, in human cells? And then if we know that bacteria go everywhere, you could have a first hypothesis that if I take this sample of different places in a human being, and then I do the same experiment a few weeks later, maybe because this human being just washed you know, their hands and did a lot of things, maybe this microbiome is going to change, but it doesn't. The, the thing is that once it's a, a community of bacteria establishes in your body, in any part of your body, it's, it's really there you know, for, for a while. It's very stable. And the same is true for, for the bacteria that you will find in soil or that even inside. Even our cells are changing, the bacteria remain? The bacteria remain. Yeah, you can, you can kill them if you take an antibiotic, for instance, and then you make a mess of a couple of things. But you skin bacteria, but the skin is changing every couple of oh, months. Oh, yeah, but right? the bacteria, they, they remain yeah, the same. Yeah. Well, in the same tone, though, the bacterial cells also are new cells insofar as, as they're, they're multiplying and dying off and new cells being replaced. And, and basically, bacteria are you know, using our, our lotion and they are using our cells you know, for growth. So pretty much different, different races, different, you know, in, at different ages of your life, you will be changing also bacteria, depending on, on, on hormones and, and other, other things. So that's, that was one sort of like surprise. I mean, bacteria are everywhere, but it's not like they, they just spread and, and you just get a new collection every time, right? It's like you really have a stable you know, community every time. So one other question is, how come there are so many different bacteria? Because their diversity, as you will see later, is amazing. So everything in life comes from the same molecule, which is DNA, okay? In DNA, you know, this is a, 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 you know, the chemistry of this, it's got sugar and phosphorus, and it has some, you know, four bases like A, C, G, and T. And just the combination of these four letters in different lengths and settings can give us all the diversity that we have in life, okay? So the, in bioinformatics, that's all we need to know. We need to know that, you know, this combination and What's this for? And we have bioinformatics. So let's make a test now, okay? You are the bioinformaticians, and I have a strain. This strain has this combination of bases in a particular gene that we use as an ID. 
So what strain is this? This is your database. Acetobacter. What's the Acetobacter. Mm. Yes? Yeah. So this is your strain one, GGAA CCD. There you go, it has this, it matches this. So it's an Acetobacter, okay? Have strain two, you know, the same thing. You, you, you check this out, check your database, and you, don't, you cannot read it, but it's Campylobacter, okay? So the other one is easy because you just deduce that it's E. coli, but yes, you can check it out, TTC. So this is bioinformatics, okay? And that's how we know what, what things live in this plant. This because is only for the ribosome? This is just for the ribosome, yes, yes. Now it's getting more complex because we can get all the DNA. But we really need a, a tiny bit of, of, um, of a piece of DNA from the same region every time to compare. We need databases and that's it. What else do we do with these pieces of DNA? We can align them together. We can put them together and then see how, how much they, they you know, look like the one below. And every time there is a difference, I'll put it in, in, in green, see? So here you have a G, but then you have a T and A and other, other letters. And here you have C and T, and that, et cetera. So what you can do now is that you can you know, cluster these in a, in a way that the, the ones that resemble the most are closest, and the ones that are more different you know, are separated. And then you can construct these sort of, uh, of cladograms, okay, that you, know, you can call them also trees. And that's how you can know how evolutionarily you know, close some things are or how different they are. You can calculate how many difference, how many green things do we need to get a new species, okay? And so we can classify everything that is living, you know, that has DNA, and we can classify this and, and, and define where they are in, in these trees. So we can know how far we are from fungi. You know? We are here in the metazoa, and we are with the drosophila, and with all the things, and vertebrates, and you won't believe that we are just this tiny thing. You're here, okay, with the vertebrates, okay? You can do this for everything. This is done for trees, for instance. And with trees, you can also classify trees. Same trick, just put it together, do this, and you will know what you have. And then if you want to understand what life really is, just put it all together. Put bacteria, put fungi, everything that you know that you heard of, just put it here. You can put here even things that are extinct because you can get that DNA and put it in this tree. And what do you find in this tree? All of these are bacteria, okay? So it's all bacteria, you know? Just don't bother, don't worry about anything else because all of life is still bacteria, okay? If you go into this branch, then you find eukaryotes, and then you'll find this little tiny thing, which is the opistoconta that has the metasolans, and even below this screen is the is us, okay? We, we didn't even feel this, okay? So we are nothing. We are just a little dot here compared to you know what's really in life, what's maintaining life together. Because it is bacteria that actually are doing the cycling of all the nutrients in life, in the oceans, the carbon, they are you know feeding the, the plant, they are feeding everything, okay? So yeah, I'm a fan of bacteria. But how do you actually go and, and, and if I cannot even you know, take out a, a bacteria, how do I even know that it exists? So I'll show you what you do when you cannot count one by one, okay? These scientists took a car and then just drove, you know, I don't know where, in the US, and they just didn't, you know, clean the, 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 the whatever, what's the Wait, the you you you. Okay, they didn't clean it. Mm. And then at the end of the trip, they, they collect everything. They use some alcohol, and then you take out all the DNA there, and then you sequence that. And then you go to the database and say, what are the insects that live in this area, okay? There you go, you have the information. And this is what we do with bacteria. You can go and, and, and take a, a swipe you know, of, of, of some of part of your skin or anything, and then just use alcohol, DNA, and get the same information. 
So this technique of metagenomics really changed you know, the way we think about biology. It really sort of like, you know, way to work, work up microbiology. Because then we realized how many bacteria and what was the diversity of bacteria in the world. And that's where Cuatro Cienegas comes in this, in this plane. So Cuatro Cienegas, it's a place in Mexico at, at the north. This is part of, of a second largest desert in, in North America. So we have part of that in, in the south of, of, of the United States and Mexico. We share this desert here. Coahuila is here. I live in, in Irapuato. Lupercio lives in Mexico City. Some people know Cancun. Okay. And you find Florida here. Okay. So this is easy, okay? Cuatro Cienegas is there. But where was it a hundred million years ago? A hundred million years ago, Cuatro Coahuila, you know, was, is nowhere to be found here because it's right here. Cuatro Cienegas is actually part of the Coahuila, and Coahuila had a shore, you know. You didn't have to go to Cancun, you could go to Coahuila, you know. But then the Gulf of Mexico emerged, and then no more ocean. But the water, the water was still hidden below, you know, the, the mountains, and it makes the ponds, and it's still there. So this water is actually, you know, creating an oasis of bacteria that are really amazing and sort of like remind us of Jurassic Park, you know, because you go there and you find everything that was in Jurassic Park, okay? So this interior basin has a lot of, of, of springs. It has many pools, it has many endemic fishes, and it has some weird properties because it has so little phosphorus, so little nutrients, that that's what's kept this place alive, that it's so poor in nutrients that not a lot of things can live there. So this is a pond in Cuatro Cienegas. When you see <coughs> a pond that is very clean, it means that you don't have nutrients, okay? It's very poor, it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen, it doesn't have a lot of phosphorus, so very few things can grow. But one amazing thing is that you have these kind of stones that are not stones. These stones are stromatolites. So stromatolites are actually bacteria. These bacteria is sort of like are, you know, they, 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 they grow together and they have layers and then a lot of carbonates sort of like precipitate on the slimy surface and they actually become stones. These so are dead bacteria, right? No, that's the important thing. In Cuatro Cienega, these are alive. So you have a lot of tiny things still making the, the, their way and they're still growing. You find the stromatolites, the lots of dead ones in a lot of places, and those are the fossils of bacteria. I mean, it's very hard to find a fossil of a bacteria. Come on, right? Yeah, sure. But if you find a stone, from stromatolite, then you know that was, you know, bacteria were there. So that's what we know about stromatolites. Those are the fossils of bacteria. Those are the keys to tell us the, what was the origin of life on Earth. So the origin of life, you know, I don't know what happened before because we don't have this, the stromatolites. But we know this, the, the, how old stromatolites are. And so we know that in Cuatro Cienegas we have a very special place where the stromatolites are still alive. We have the same types of bacteria, you know, that, that live in other, you know, in other places. And then also we have, you know, a, an idea of an old chemistry, okay? Because when the planet was, was forming, of course, the atmosphere was not with, with oxygen. So what happens is that it took a long time before oxygen started to appear there. It required for the evolution of cyanobacteria here, which are photosynthetic bacteria. And these bacteria started to use CO2, make, make oxygen. Oxygen, of course, is very toxic. No one wants to live with oxygen if, if you know they are in anaerobes. So the chemistry of the whole planet had to change. Because there was no oxygen, even the phosphorus was not linked to an oxygen, it was linked to a carbon. That's phosphonate, that's what we, what Monsanto used for herbicides, okay? because no one can grow with, with this thing. Okay? But later in evolution, then in an oxygenic place, then you have now oxygen and phosphorus. 
Other things that were not common, like copper, you, you didn't see them free here. Now they are free. So even, even copper sort of like starts to get used in evolution. So just to tell you that the chemistry of the world is really linked to the evolution of things in, in, in the planet. Some organism used hemoglobin to, to make their blood and to circulate oxygen because they used iron in this, in this molecule. And other organisms like, you know, like squids and octopuses, they chose copper to move oxygen, okay? So they have hemocyanin and those are blue. So some organisms have blue blood and some you know, have, it's not really blood, but okay, that's, that's the, what, it, what it is. And, um, and so that tells you how, you know, how critical it is when life starts and evolves. What is the chemistry? I mean, the, the organisms are changing the environment, but the environment is also changing the organisms, okay? And these stromatolites, if we open them up, what we find was that we have different layers. Each of these layers is composed of a, a different, you know, different organisms that have different strategies in, in chemistry. So you have some that prefer sulfur, and then it, life starts evolving from no oxygen and sulfur to you know, oxygenic, and, and then now you use light. So this is you know, the evolution of life. So if you take apart the stromatolite, you have the record of life there, of how things evolved, okay? So that's what it's really fascinating to have in, in Quattro Cienegas. You could do a metagenome, sort of like the windshield experiment, but in the Quattro Cienegas, you know, in one of these places, which is called Churinse. This is the bacteria that you find. You know, each of these things means to be, you know, a, a film of bacteria here, okay? So you find 60%, 66% of the bacteria known in the world, you can find them in Quattro Cienegas, okay? And I'll tell you something about this particular group, which is the one that I work with. If you take that bacteria and then just take those that you can culture, we have you know, cultivated in the lab you know, more than a thousand strains just of bacillus. And then if we ask, how many new species do you find? <coughs> All the blue are the new species that we find, okay? This, this is like the world of, of 100 years of people looking for bacillus. After two years, just looking in Cuatro Cienegas, we have 26% of, of, the, of the species, you know, that were not previously found in the world, and now they are found in Cuatro Cienegas. So, you know, we have published this, and we call Cuatro Cienegas the lost world, because we are really finding a lot of, of, of organisms that are not found in other places in the world that we think are part of the, of the bacteria that were you know, still in this you know, underwater that was previously an ocean, okay? In fact, many of those, when you culture them, they look very much like some things from the oceans. Okay, but what my lab really wants to understand is all these bacteria, how come they are you know, together forming communities? So if this is a community and each of these you know, dots with colors is a species or a bacteria or you know, any strain, how come they are together? So one is a stochastic model in which, okay, you, 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 are, you just are born there or some were extinct or some came from dispersion and they were randomly selected from the environment, okay? So how different would this be from a car community you know, in a parking lot? Okay, would be the same thing, you would just to toss them around and you will just find them randomly? Or is there anything else? So that's sort of like the null model, okay? The null model is you just toss around bacteria and you find communities and it doesn't mean anything because it's all stochastic. But then you can also think about a deterministic model in which they each have a, a different function and not just that, they help each other to grow. And so if they are interacting, if they are cooperating, they are competing, then it's not stochastic. Let's look at the DNA composition of three bacteria, you know, three green bacteria that you find there. 
So what I have here is that this is the genome of one bacteria. These are the composition of, of its genes. This is another <coughs> one. This is another one. All bacteria share a group of genes that are needed to live, not to grow, to reproduce. They all share those. But then bacteria also have specialized genes to that you have their viruses, transposons, you have sugar utilization things, phosphorus, antibiotics, synthesis. So you have a lot of things that represent the ecology of the place. So bacteria have to collect a set of genes to be able to live in your gut or to be able to live in Cuatro Cienegas, okay? If they don't have the right genes, they cannot colonize your gut because they will not be resisting the pH, you know, coming through or the anaerobic conditions. So it is a, a set of genes that allows bacteria to actually colonize something. And so we think then that some of this is deterministic. If we take a collection of bacteria, again, these are, this is a tree and this is how they are, you know, the, the different groups. Each of these dots, if you see it in a color, means that it has that function. If it's got no color, it lacks the function. So what we found here is that a lot of bacteria are really mutants. They are lacking, you know, part of, of things that other have, okay? So it's like you, you get to the exam, I have a pen, you have, you have, a, 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 you have paper, Okay, let's you know, split the pencil, give me a piece of shit. I mean, so you, you, you can, you know, you, you have to share resources. So this is what we have. We have that bacteria really have incomplete gene, genomes, okay? They don't have enough genes to get by in an environment. They really need to, to, to sort of like share things with other bacteria. For instance, this is a petri dish and you don't see anything because nothing grew and you don't see anything because it just also did not grow. But if you get these bacteria together, then they grow. Because this bacteria, the 316, is feeding you know, something to this other bacteria, and this bacteria is maybe feeding something else to the next one. So this is what happens in communities, that bacteria are actually <coughs> sharing information, they are sharing genes, and that is what makes things possible. This is a model where enzymes and genes are public goods, okay? So you don't have to have a full collection of genes to live in a given place because you can have 10% as long as your neighbor has another, you know, other ones that you need. So you can really be sharing all these public goods, for instance, for phosphorus. You don't need to be able to use all kinds of, all the sources of phosphorus. If some use DNA as, as a source of phosphorus, if some use calcium, phosphate, whatever, at the end, all of them are going to become you know, inorganic phosphate and you know, anyone can use it. So that's what these, these public goods are, okay? And that's what makes it, you know, it's sort of like layers of complexity and complexity and complexity as you go deeper in understanding communities. So I wanted to, to understand a particular community in this place, which is the, the Turinse. So I take these very tiny samples and I ask, do these bacteria grow together or they kill each other? What are they doing? So we actually asked whether they could produce antibiotics, which is a weapon in, in, the, in, the, in nature, right? Bacteria produce antibiotics and kill each other. So what you have here on the background is a bacteria growing. And on the top, you have other bacteria growing. And then this, this sort of like halo that you see, it's because bacteria were not able to grow there, okay? This one is producing an antibiotic that it's not allowing growth of this other one. So we can test this for 78 strains, okay? So we do a matrix of 78 times 78 times all the reprodu reproducing experiments that biologists need, okay? <laughs> and we can have a network and we can ask, how do these bacteria get together, okay? Do they get along well? Each of these circles represents a bacterial strain. The green bacteria do not do, not do anything, they are just there, okay? 
this bacteria here that is connected here, okay, with this graph, this connection means that this is killing everything that is connected there, okay? So it's really a carbon <coughs> that kills all of this. And then you have all of these bacteria that are being killed by somebody here, okay? So we dig that for, for a lot of bacteria, so we know which bacteria don't seem to interact, which bacteria are killing others, and which bacteria are sensitive. Then we gave up because it was too much work, okay? <laughs> and then we decided to do something more simple. Say, so why do we have to understand all 78? Maybe we can see what's happening with three of them. So we took three of them, one from the top, that did not kill anybody, one that killed other, other bacteria, and that one that was sensitive. So we have this community, we have the data for each, we constructed a, a matrix here, and we have the ID for each of the 78 bacteria, and we know who they kill and who they don't kill. So we can do then this, this cellular automaton to figure out whether, I mean, why, why are these bacteria there? Why aren't these, the, why, these dominant bacteria that make antibiotics, why aren't those the dominant thing and, and the other things just are extinct? I mean, so in this cellular automaton, we, we seed, you know, these strains, okay? Every time a strain grows, if it finds a sensitive bacteria, it's going to kill it. If it finds, you know, if, you know resistant bacteria, it's not going to kill it. So at the end, what you have is this. There's no extinction of, of this bacteria. In fact, you have sort of like patches, and these patches really have, you know, like, like these bacteria that are killed often, as long as they are surrounded by resistant bacteria, they will not be antagonized, okay? If you repeat this experiment, but now you shake, you know, your in silico plate so that you get a lot of perturbations, then when you, have, when you have this extinction, then immediately some of the bacteria, the sensitive ones, are going to die, and you will only have the resistant bacteria and the antagonistic bacteria, okay? The sensitive are, are gone. Can we do the same but with real experiments? So we took one bacteria of each, okay? <coughs> We can tell them apart because this one makes this kind of colony, which is larger and, and sort of like a cream color. This one is a bit smaller and the <coughs> sensitive is yellowish. So we do, we're going to do the same experiments, okay? We are going to put together the antagonist and the sensitive, and then we're going to put them together, and after five minutes or 30 minutes, we'll see who survived. Then we'll do the same, but with all three, after different times, we'll see who survives. So what happens if I put together this the antagonist and the sensitive? I know that this one kills this one. Well, the antagonist, nothing happens after 30 minutes, it's still there, okay? I'm measuring growth in the Petri dish, okay? And this is time. But I can see that the sensitive bacteria die, okay? you'll see that it doesn't really die completely. You know, some of it is still there, but I'll tell you more about that later. So what can we say? Okay, this is easy, right? I have the antagonist, you know, and it, it grows and the sensitive declines, so there is a competitive interaction. If I have a sensitive and a resistant, nothing happens, both grow, nothing happens, no, no interaction. If both grow, you know, the, the resistant and, and the antagonists, they, they don't do anything to each other, they grow. So what's going to happen if we just grow the three together? So that's what happens. What happens is that when we grow the three together, there is no more killing, okay? The sensitive bacteria survives. So even in, 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 you know, in, in a few minutes, this, there's no killing, so this is an emergent property. You couldn't have expected this to happen. And it really behaves in a petri dish just like the cellular automaton. You have that some of these bacteria sort of like find a little patch far away from the antagonist and they survive. If they have the, the large ones, which are the resistant, they also find a place surrounded by these resistant and they survive, okay? 
So we're doing these things to understand what's going on, that now we can put some inside a membrane and the other one outside, and we want to figure out you know, if, if, there's, if is there an antibiotic that is killing it or not. So what we find is the same thing. Even if we put them apart, they don't have to touch each other. It can kill it even when it's one in the dialysis bag. But this is what I wanted to show you. It doesn't kill all the population. There's always something remaining. What is that you know, thing that remains? Is it like, like the population has sensitive, but they're always survivors? This is a very important question because this is what we find in, in medicine for, for antibiotics, okay? We cannot always kill everything, and that's a big problem for the systems, okay? So, what, well, again, you need a dialysis bag. If you put the three, they all survive. So what happens if I take some of the surviving bacteria, okay, and, and you said something happens there, they, don't keep, they are not dying anymore. So I'll put fresh bacteria here and see what happens. If I add fresh of the sensitive bacteria to this flask, it doesn't die. Something changed in the media, something, something changed there, I have no idea, it's completely unexpected. Again, it's something you, you cannot you know, predict. <coughs> this is another experiment. I take some of the bacteria that already was in the presence of the antagonist. And I put it with fresh antagonists. Say, let's see if, if now it's going to be killed. And what happens, it survives. Otherwise, I wouldn't be telling you all of this. So again, we have these emergent properties. And why is this important? Because this was the, the, for the model. The model is, oh, this is so easy. I have a resistance, antagonist, sensitive. But the real thing <coughs> is that this one is changing things for this one. This one is changing this for this one. It's also this one you know, to this. So there are all these interactions going on here. Okay. So even with three bacteria, we have no clue of what is going on. <coughs> I think I have five more minutes. Yes. Okay. So that that mm, is an interesting question now, I and mean, it's sort of like if you look at the literature these these last two years, everything is about higher order, you know, interactions, and higher order interactions means that sort of like the classic ecology, Lord Cavaltera, which means it's like as long as you have you know, a lot of rabbits, then the population of the predator is going to come up. Once the population of the predator comes up, then the rabbits are going to go down. And this is a, a classic equation. But now that in, in communities we have thousands of bacteria and we have emergent properties, it so happens that people are trying to find, you know, uh, sort of like to do something to Lord Cavaltera to be able to do something, okay? So we have these, these analyses, you know, these suggest that we have a higher order interactions. We're doing the molecular biology, we're doing other analyses. But the truth is that it's sort of like the place where all the ecologists are trying to understand what is going on in nature in any community? So if you have a community like this one, you have a shrub, and in the presence of the shrub, sort of like the grass grows better, and that's because this one is limiting growth of this, so that leaves more room for this one. So the thing is, you know, things that you cannot predict because there is just not an interaction of one to one. So this is, you know, what's going on now in biology, that you don't know how to predict what are the stable combinations in anything. And I don't know if, if you ever take probiotics. Okay? Who knows what we're doing with probiotics, OK? We don't know what we're doing. In agriculture, we are putting in a lot of, of, of biofertilizers, which are bacteria and fungi. We don't know what's going on with any of these bacteria or fungi there, OK? So this becomes a very important thing, because when we take antibiotics, we kill a lot of bacteria, but not all. So what happens with the, with the community that remains? Are, you know, it's really a, a problem. So the thing is, we don't know anything. And we, there are plenty of papers that do a lot of mathematical simulations, 
tell me any model that you want in mathematics and economy, and it's been tested now on community ecology, okay? If you want to know, for instance, in the gut, what happens with a probiotic species, when you, you know, just let me know. If, how often can I find two bacteria, two bacteria? How often do I find four? How often six, eight, 10, 12, 15, 20, okay? And it goes on and on, and I cannot predict much, okay? And what happens is that this, this, the assembly of communities as, as they grow makes prediction you know, much more difficult, okay? So this is one of the, of the main problems now in, in studying you know, these communities. And this is just looking at species. But what about looking at the genes there? Okay, so that's another layer of complexity. Okay, so that's the same thing for, for insects. If you want to predict for bees, and you only have 10 different species or 10 taxa, and you want to know how many combinations you can do and so that each insect is going to carry inside <coughs> any of, of a different combination of 10 taxa. And then you ask how many of those combinations are going to be stable. So that's why you have like different colors, which tells you how many times the same combination you know, survived. Okay? Again, this is very important because there are, you know, there's a lot of mortality in, in insects and bees and everything has bacteria, and everything has, you know, that is alive has bacteria, so it becomes a very important work, okay? So we'll, we'll continue exploring functional traits, you know, the competition, we'll figure out if we can, you know, simulate invasions and, and see what's going on. And then this work in Cuatro Cienegas is also serving the purpose of, you know, making aware of, you know, to the population that you have to be careful with water, that you cannot cultivate alfalfa in the desert because this happens, okay? So they cultivate alfalfa in the desert in Cuatro Cienegas and some of the ponds are dry, okay? So it's like, ah, oh, yeah, evolution made all these airports to maintain this Jurassic Park and it's gone, okay? So there are other surprises in Cuatro Cienegas. We are working with other things that seem to be, you know, even older. And, you know, so we, we still have a lot of things to do, but we, have, we are worried about Cuatro Cienegas. We run molecular biology laboratories. We have in the high school in Cuatro Cienegas a molecular biology lab. So we work with high school kids in, in there so that they sort of like understand the science with the scientists, know what, what we are doing, they work with us. And um, we also run other workshops, you know, to attract you know, young people to science, to this kind of, of, of work and experiments. And this is my lab, okay? And my collaborators, we only drink beers and these guys do the work, so it's great life, okay? <laughs> And of course, we have to find money, and um, so we usually have money from from Conacyt, which is a, a research, you know, foundation for for funding science in, in Mexico. And well, we also got money from part of this from the World Wildlife Alianza Carlos Slim. And so that's how we sort of put together this work. Thank you. When you mentioned the three species that when you added the third one, the weak one survived, I just wonder, it's just a thought, uh, if maybe there's some model of game theory that applies there. Yeah, what? Model maybe of there's a model of game theory that applies there. Yes, uh, yeah. There's, I don't know, if you, know, you probably know better, I'll, I'll give you the papers. <laughs> there's, they have done every model for different communities. The only problem that I see in these papers is that they just look at, you know, at the presence absence of different bacteria or different things. It's a, like they take a sample with millions of species and they ask, do they co-occur? You know, do they? Do I find the same two, the same three, the same four? That there are no other experiments. I have a collaborator. He's doing this marriage problem in which he wonders what kinds of sugars or preferences, you know, the substrates they are using, and to try to find something, you know, behind that. 
not just a model, but some experiments to see their preferences. You know, if you in, in this, you know, game theory, what would be your preferred, you know, sugar or substrate? And you know, would you be will, taking, you know, from your partner or not? But so far, there are no experiments. These are just models. You know. And the second question: you, Is your work uh, influenced by the melting icebergs, by climate change? No. I do have I do have another work that, that has to do with, with evo experimental evolution to temperature. Mm -hmm. So when when uh, you have the sensitive bacteria uh, die off and there are a few survivors, are those survivors genetically distinct mm -hmm. right. from the ones that that died? Okay, we have not sequenced them. I mean, we don't know uh, all the details. We just know that we can recover them and put them again to test, and then they behave identical to, to before. They will also, so half of it, they, they will survive. So, I mean, they, they are not changing what they do, but I, I cannot so tell. there must be some different I mean, property. Evolution happens so quickly in bacteria, we have mutations so quickly, but I don't think we have 20% of, of the population mutated so quickly. So I think that it's more a regulation thing. Maybe there are genes that are turned on and off, and you can do that very quickly in 20% of the population. But, but in fact, um, I was thinking along the lines of what Jose just said, which is when you re-inoculated, um, mm -hmm. did you inoculate from the residual population or yes. from your initial inoculation? Because I think the answer is inside there, because if you're, if you're re-inoculating from your residual population, then in fact you've enriched for. Oh yeah, um, but that yeah, that's the idea. I mean, we right. take the survivors, so, so, so we know we enrich that, and we know that's, that's what are left. So we do both things. We start fresh with the new population, and we take the residual population, which we know it's just the enriched survivors. Yes. So we do both. I have a very nice question. Uh, you show numbers several times. For example, 66.28% of biodiversity uh, was concentrated on the surface in the lake. When you say 66.28%, do you mean by head count of species or do you mean by furthest genetic distance on classification tree or maybe this is PAYs morphological accumulation? It's, you know, it's of all phyla known in the world we can find 67% of those in, in this particular place. It's just a percent of, of, of you know, the species, of the, species of the, of the, at the field level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I, I have a question on a different topic. Um, you use the word structure. Mm -hmm. So does that mean potentially physical structures yes. where um, either um, nutrients Novel metabolites, for example, could could actually be concentrated. Um, so, so if the same experiment is run on a solid substrate, like a plate, as opposed to a rod, uh, would you get different survival? Curves? Absolutely, it's completely different. And and structure does mean that. So most bacteria actually live in, in communities in biofilms. Yeah. So these biofilms are these structured things. Every time you know you have a biofilm, you have a community, so like inside that has less oxygen, that it less permeability to nutrients. So it's like you really have in, in itself very different environments every time you, you have a biofilm. Yeah, so it, structure means physical you know, structure. So in different communities of plants and animals, there's this concept of the apex species. So that one species mm -hmm. controls mm -hmm. the, the concentration, the numbers of other. Mm -hmm. Does that hold in the uh, bacterial colonies? I mean, do you have one strain that sort of is an apex strain? There, there is now, in fact, what is called the dark matter, you know, in, in, in bacteria. Because <coughs> the, the dark matter, which means, we, we don't know 
you know, what a lot of this diversity means. <coughs> if you have a, a curve, you have like, like the, the, the very, you know, a very, very long tail of things that appear only once in the community. So what, what does these rare, rare things you know, mean? So you don't know if 10% for a community means a lot because you don't know what the function is. I mean, you have a single director, you know, it has to be important. Right? You have a lot of people doing other jobs. So we don't know in bacteria, you know, what a keystone species means. There is one paper that I know that tries to simulate that and just by the frequent occurrence, it, it tells you, oh, this is a key species. But it's, there, there isn't enough information to, to know if, if that is true, like it is in the macroecology. Yeah, so I, I want to know. People so are more are putting attention to, to things that, that occur in lower percents, but might have a very important <coughs> But it's not only the numbers, that the experiment is to yes. delete that one species yes. and then everything falls apart. Whereas if you delete mm -hmm. another species within there, the things change a little yeah, bit. Yeah, we, we want to do that experiment. We really want to do that experiment. We are figuring out how to how to kill from a complex community just a you know, just a few, you know, or a few species or something and, and see what happens. But I haven't seen that except in modeling. Mm -hmm. What you were saying about killing one species sounds like the superbug that everybody is trying mm -hmm. to heal. I mean, does any of this work that you do apply to actual uh, illnesses, diseases, bacterial infections? I think that the only application that you know that I see is, is on, on the knowledge and the concepts because they are going to be the same. If you go to Pacosienegas and take a plate with the last antibiotic in, you know, in, 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 in the drugstore, and then you put all these bacteria to grow there, they all grow on, on it. Okay? So bacteria invite me are the inventors of the antibiotics and are the inventors of the ways to, to avoid the antibiotics. So it doesn't matter what antibiotic you go in, into the wild and test, they, they all have the, you know, the ability to avoid it or to kill it or to degrade it. So it, it's in, in that way, yes, it is important because what you learn applies in, in the gut. Yeah. But then you will eventually have to do the experiments in the gut. Yeah. <coughs> I'm curious, a typos in humans are also in process. I don't know what about typos in DNA. You have mentioned presence of large percentage of mutants and fast mutation. Uh, what algorithm, what technique, what software do you use as your spell checker when you identify mutants? You have to tell a mutant from, uh, yes. another, from uh, representative of another species, or so even spell checker. Yes, so we isolate each one. Or, or, or a bunch, and we sequence all the DNA. So if it's you know, you know, four million bases, we sequence them all, and then we combine them with a wild type bacteria, the one that is not mutated, and we find every change. And it would be almost impossible to find changes. In bacteria that we just use in the lab, and you, you know, it's bacteria that people use in the lab, like E. coli or whatever, Every time you sequence one, you would find new mutations. And maybe those mutations don't mean anything, we don't, you know, we don't know. But yes, all these strains are mutating all the time. So if I could add um, mm -hmm. a nuance to the answer, which I think addresses the point, which is that we only have reference genomes for species that we can culture. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. No. Well, and okay. Yes. Substantially now, no, no, now we have the, the single cell genomics. Now we can yes. sequence you know, things that we have not cultured, you know, and then we can use that as, as a reference. But still, but, but most of the knowledge that we have come from these reference traits. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that that's going to be a challenge now to figure out if everything is E. coli or bacillus, or we have you know, way more in this diversity. Right, because when you're in a metagenomics environment, wow. single cell genomics becomes a huge statistical problem, right? Yes. 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 
Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for the video.